I'd like to introduce our first panel called Engineers and Designers, The Human Factor. And our first speaker will be Gaspar Shalamon from the Humboldt University in Berlin. And uh, Gaspar is an art historian, junior research associate at the Leibniz Institute for the History of and Culture of uh, Eastern Europe at the University of Leipzig as well, and doctoral student at the Humboldt University in Berlin. The main focus of his research is the history of architecture in Austria-Hungary in the long 19th century, especially architectural mobility, knowledge transfer in architectural education, and open-air architectural display. So, okay, so Gaspar, please join us here. Much Marta for the kind introduction and also thank you very much for this great initiative and and organizing this um, conference and also having me in uh, Paris to present one of the I guess two case studies um, related to Hungary. The main historic historical building group erected in 1896 in the city park on the outskirts of Budapest is known to be one of the most iconic artworks reflecting the political situation in Austria-Hungary at the fin de siècle. Built on the occasion of the Millennial National Exhibition commemorating the conquest of the Car Carpathian Basin by Hungarian tribes in 896, the historical section with its numerous exhibits and its architectural setting consisting of copies of significant historic structures played a major role in the manufacturing of national identity by making reference to the historical past. This was part of an overarching ideological framework for the millennial festivities encompassing the glorification of national achievements in urban modernization and industrialization, as well as the ostensive promotion of Hungarian national culture. The main goals of the millennial event were uh, linked with the kaleidoscopic ethnic variety of the Hungarian kingdom on the one hand, and with the political tensions between the Austrian and Hungarian parts of the dual monarchy on the other. Such a monumental attempt at nation branding was thus to reinforce the claim of the Hungarian, uh, ethnic Hungarians, Magyars, to the role of leader among the various ethnicities of what was called a political nation. At the same time, the exhibition asserted political, economic and cultural sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the Habsburg court. Seemingly, the political and social machinery of Hungarian nation building provides the primary interpretative framework for the discussion about the main historical building group. This predominant framing of the building ensemble corresponds to the notion of exhibitionary complexes advanced by Tony Bennett as an <laughs> Um, exhibition, exhibitionary complexes advanced by Tony Bennett as he analyzes exhibitory spaces and institutions of the 19th century that articulate or even facilitate social and political power. Likewise, national or imperial political narratives are often considered as dispositive that um, pervaded the conception, curatorial practice and the realization of fairs similar to the millennial exhibition. However, this notion ignores the praxeological complexity of human agency by implying general patterns in the decisions, personal motives, and ideological positions of the involved in the individuals. For this reason, I'm not going to deal with the main historical building group as an example of how visual arts are used in the political legitimation of nation building efforts. Instead, I will present the academic program behind this arrangement of architectural objects drawing on theories and practices of art historical scholarship to which the key is the human factor. The protagonist of this paper is Béla Zobor, archaeologist, art historian, university professor and spiritus rector behind the concept of the main historical building group. One can say that Béla Zobor's appointment as the director of the historical exhibition was a logical consequence of his stellar career as an art historian and monument man. Although Zobor, born, uh, born in 1852, belonged to the second generation of Hungarian art, historian, uh, art historians, he worked in proximity to several founding fathers, such as Arnold Ipoi, Flori Schomer, and Ferenc Polsky. Beginning his studies at the seminary in Pest, Zobor's attention was drawn by um, the prominent scholar 
honored Ipoi toward art history and what used to be called Christian archaeology. Um, following his ordination to the priesthood in 1875, Sobor held positions at the Hungarian National Museum and at the University of Budapest before being appointed as the chief referent of the National Monuments Commission in 1889. During his term in office, Hungarian monument protection departed in many aspects from the until then common practices of so-called purism, shifting toward new principles. Increasing attention was given to profound and systematic research as well as careful conservation of monuments as opposed to hasty and corrective restoration. With such a professional background, Sobol earned the assignment of curating the historical section of the Millennial Exhibition. He played from the beginning a decisive role, not only in acquiring objects of historical value and art pieces to exhibit in the section, but also in the design of their actual set, uh, architectural setting. And this is actually the focus of my presentation. In 1893, uh, Sobor, along with his colleagues in the directorship of the historical section, presented the pre preliminary concept for the architecture of the main historical building group, which already envisioned exhibition pavilions characterized by different historical styles, using life-sized reproductions of architectural details. This idea had also found its way into the text of the competition called Seeking Entries for the Design of the Main Historical Building Group. The design submitted by the prominent architect, architect uh, Ignaz Olpar was one of the, be uh, one, is, was the, one, the, be uh, the best met the requirements of the competition program by assembling copies of distinguished historic monuments into a picturesque composition that consisted of Romanesque, a Gothic, a Renaissance or Baroque pavilion. The most detailed description of the pavilions can be found in a lavish catalog. Thank you. Accompanying the historical exhibition, edited by Zobor and some others, uh, published in Vienna in 1897, which provides a guide for tracing scholarly constructs of art history and its neighbor, neighboring disciplines in the way the main historical building group was assembled. The complex was accessible in the first instance from the main boulevard of the millionaire exhibition via bridge that arched across the pond that encircled the complex. As one entered the gate, all three groups uh, of buildings unfolded visually to highlight in advance the narrative based on uh, the history of styles. The spatial staging of the buildings, which determined a certain order in which they would be visited, corresponded largely to the stylistic chronology. Thus, the visitor was directed first to the Romanesque building. Its most attractive part was a copy of the portal of the monastery church in Yak, attached to a rather blocky chapel-like structure. Here, the life-sized reproduction of the portal of Yak was not only exhibited as an appealing example of Romanesque architecture in Hungary. The choice, as Sobor made clear, also referred to a historiographical dimension since it reflected upon the internationally acclaimed canonical position of the sculpture work within the history of Romanesque art. A quote from the catalog of Sobor. Um, the ingenuity of the Middle Ages manifested in the variety of ornaments and subtlety of the forms make the portal one of the most beautiful uh, monuments, not only in Hungary, but also in Central Europe, just as prominent art historians from home and abroad were competing with one another to appraise it in their works." End of quote. With this remark, Sobor referred to the portal's distinguished position in German-speaking art historiography, in the works of uh, Franz Kugler, Karl Schnase, and Wilhelm Lübcke, among others, a position that dates back to Rudolf Eiterberger's extensive article on the Romanesque monuments in Hungary, published as early as 1856 in the yearbook of the Centra Commission zur Erforschung und Erhaltung der Baudenkmale. The Austrian art historian positioned the portal as one um, of the key works of the Romanesque period, surpassing even the so-called Riesentor of the Stephansdom in Vienna. 
More importantly, through the Romance Complex, a certain methodological tool of art historical scholarship took shape, namely the search for typological and morphological analogies that was often used in theoretical hypothesis as well as in the practice of monument restoration. Starting from the question of the possible re uh, reconstruction of a cloister building adjacent to the chapel uh, with the portal of Yak, a hypothesis was developed by Tsobor based on French analogies that enabled the completion of the monastery complex with a representative courtyard. Such reconstruction of the cloister was closely aligned with Sobor's view, which he propagated in an 1890 publication about the contribution of French architects to the 13th century construction his history of the Yak complex. This hypothesis, based on similarities uh, of detailing with monuments in France, as well as the Hungarians' Benedictines' contact with those of Cluny, was quite unlike concurrent theories based mostly on analogies with examples from the German the territory. As the second example of how scholarly concepts and methods were reflected by the main historical building group, let us look at the so-called Tower of the Apostles, situated in the Gothic court opposite the Romanist complex containing the Portal of Jak. The tower was copied, from, um, <clears throat> copied for the most part from the medieval clock tower in Shageshwar to the Shigishwara, Romania, in Transylvania. This detail of the exhibition highlights a mode of presentation that I call archaeological, as it reflects both in descriptive and methodological ways upon the stratification of historical building fabric according to different periods of the monument's construction history. I quote again from the catalog. <clears throat> the other wing of the Gothic building group ends with a well-made imitation of the Tower of Shageshwar. The tower, for the most part, dates back to the Middle Ages. The top floor was designed as a rough reconstruction construction in order to indicate, on the one hand, that this part, which once fell victim to a fire, is of more recent date, while, on the other hand, it serves as a suitable transition to the neighboring baroque group of buildings through the tin-covered roof dating from the 17th century." End of quote. The reconstruction of the tower highlights the various, <clears throat> the various periods of its construction from its medieval substructures via the restoration of the upper segments from the 17th century onward through the Baroque spire in a way which can be referred to as archaeological. By this I mean on the one hand the methods of the so-called historische Bauforschung, a set of practices evolved from archaeology which encompassed the meticulous documentation of monuments, uh, of the monument's current condition with special regard to its material and building technology to elicit the stage of, uh, stages of construction history. This method was widely implemented in Hungary in the practice of restoration or conservation of historic monuments. On the other hand, the Tower of the Apostles made the stratification of historical construction periods visible in a manner that evokes some of the earliest methods of presenting archaeological findings in exhibition contexts. This connection is all the more plausible because one of the, uh, of the pioneers of visual visualizing, visualizing um, archaeological findings and methods in Hungary was Béla Zobor himself. He elaborated a remarkable yet unsuccessful program for the section of archaeology at the National Exhibition in 1885, some 10 years uh, before the Millennial Exhibition, at the same venue in the city, city park Budapest. <clears throat> he suggested a methodologically reflected way of staging the ar archaeological findings. Um, I quote from the concept of Tsobor for this archaeological section. It is our firm intention to present the various artifacts in a way that very few people have ever seen. Above all, we will present the prehistoric artifacts as they came to light from the layers of the earth. There you will see under the glass plate a group of human bones and bones of cave bears laid in the ground as they came into, sunlight, into the sunlight. Next to it will be installed a Bronze Age tomb, also in the layer of earth on the grass. Plus, um, there will be intact half-excavated and completely unopened urns, as well as interesting layer comprising the kitchen base typical of 
prehistoric peoples, end of quote. Thus, the idea of visualizing historical sequences uh, through the stratification of periods with a certain methodological reflection upon their scholarly exploration can be traced back to earlier principles of archaeological display. And what is more important, this continuity is represented by the person of Tsobor. As the teen spire on the Tower of the Apostles leads the viewer's eye toward the domes of the adjacent Baroque and Renaissance complex, so I move to the art geographical approach, the last scholarly cons uh, construct to present today, of which the later building provides a telling example. The southern and western facades of the pavilion facing the pond highlight prominent monuments of the so-called Upper Hungarian Renaissance. That the two facades were intended to represent a specific art geographical unit is stressed by the accompanying text in Tsobos catalog. The text outlines the historical background by describing the intensive trading activity in Upper Hungary, especially in the counties Sepes and Sáros, along um, <clears throat> the northern border of the Hungarian kingdom that could persist because the Ottomans ruled only in the middle and the southern uh, regions of the um, former Hungarian territory. Such an economic Conjuncture, according to the text, resulted in a unique style. The outline addresses the features of the Upper Hungary Renaissance and traces its origins back to the neighboring uh, Poland. Quote, the architectural style fashionable in the upper lands characterized in particular by the lacework gables of which you can find shining examples on the city hall of Posen or the Krakow clothes hall was imported to us from Poland. In fact, this style was brought by Italian masters to Poland, where it developed, in a very, uh, developed a very special character, and it then found fertile soil in the 17th century in the counties of Sepes and Sharos, where it took on, certainly, again, a local and national character." End of quote. The text thus differentiates the upper countries as a specific art geographical region by ident identifying the historical determinants, isolation from the uh, Ottoman reign and trade conjuncture, as well as the process that we today call cultural transfer between Upper Hungary and neighboring Poland. At the same time, the description seemingly pays tribute to the national narrative <clears throat> uh, of the exhibition, implying a specific Hungarian national element in the Upper Hungarian Renaissance. However, the notion of a peculiarly Hungarian Renaissance architecture can be seen as a, as a scholarly construct analogous to the categories of German or French Renaissance propagated, among others, um, the, uh, by the German art historian Wilhelm Lübcke, whose works were widely read in Hungary. Likewise, from the 1870s uh, Hungarian scholars like Imre Henselmann or uh, Viktor Mishkovsky developed the art geographical con concept of Hungarian National Renaissance architecture based on monuments of Upper Hungary. My closing remarks will have a lot, on, lot in common with one of the central arguments of the recent book, The Museum Age in Austria-Hungary, uh, edited by Matthew Rempley, which questions the role of centralized ideological directives in the formation of museal collections and spaces. In the same book, Mura Vespremi stresses the significance of personal qualities, newly developed disciplinary roles and identities in the museum world, as opposed to the over-interpretation of top-down ideological mechanisms. This applies also to the problem of, um, of the main historical building group, which through the analogy making, the archeological um, and art geographical approach, reflects Sobor's personal scholarly interests and methodological orientation. This way, scholarly practices clearly predominated over the ideological imperatives of nation building in the ensemble's narrative. After all, the main historical building group does not seem to be a disciplinary space where visitors were indoctrinated, indoctrinated by a single national narrative on Hungarian history and culture, but they were, in fact, invited to an intellectual journey, journey across the history of art and architecture of the homeland. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, we will leave the discussion at the end of the panel, um, and I would like to invite uh, Martina Hrabová here, um, who is an arts and architectural historian with a special interest in Central Europe and France. She focuses on questions of social and cultural context of the ex uh, exchange of ideas and on mechanisms of creating myths in history. She has been researching Czech assistance of Le Corbusier, and she recently published a book with the title Galaxy Le Corbusier. That's thanks to the organizers. <laughs> Does it work? Is it okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, I would like to thank to, uh, to INHA uh, and to the CRACE project, um, and especially to Marta Filipova for making this event happen. And it is very nice to meet here um, in Paris, uh, one of the key venues of world exhibitions. I will move forward a little bit in time. And in my paper, I will address one individual case uh, related to the international exhibition of art and technology, which took place in this very city in the 1937. I would like to present you a Czech female architect, Magda Jancová, and her path through her involvement in the exhibition grounds. I will describe the way she was trying to participate in the official program of the Czechoslovak Republic, as well as the means how she finally got in the area of the exhibition. As you will see, her projects might seem contradictory, but in the end, I would like to suggest how can we find certain similarities within the frame of national representation at the World's Fair. As the title of the exhibition indicates, the fair in 1937 was highly oriented on applied arts and modern industry. Since the birth of Czechoslovakia in the 1918 and its liberation from the rule of Austro-Hungarian monarchy, the new Republic was a keen participant at the international exhibitions and the, in the interwar period. The exhibitions were an active tool of self-confirmation of the new and independent state, as well as a means of becoming an important part at the international scene represented in culture, politics, and industry. In 1937, Czechoslovakia was represented at the Paris exhibition by a famous pavilion, designed chiefly by Jeromir Krejcar, Vladislav Sutnar, and their team. The design uh, of the pavilion can be seen as a jewel itself. Um, uh, as we can see on the pictures, uh, one taken in the daytime, and second in the night to enhance the effects of the artificial lighting. However, the competition for the project of the pavilion did not have a clear winner in the beginning. A year before, in July 1936, when the results of the competition were published, there were seven awarded projects and a winning scheme was to be chosen afterwards after required adjustments of the selected designs. All of the winning schemes were designed by more than one designer and all of them were men. Except the design by Magda Jancová, who was the only woman in the competition and who designed her project entirely on her own. The project by Jancová had two major parts, a hall intended for the ideological representation on the picture on the left, of the representation of the state, a national exhibition that was accessible from the main entrance from the Quai d'Orsay, as we can see the interior on the second picture. Second part faced the riverside with a spacious industrial hall of four floors. It was criticized mainly because of construction reasons and for the spiral stair staircases at the outside corners of the structure, which were considered dangerous. Nevertheless, the project was purchased by the Czechoslovak side and exhibited at the Museum, Applied Art, Museum of Applied Arts in Prague, along with other winning designs. At the very same time, Magda Jancová left for Paris, thanks to a fellowship from the Czechoslovak government in order, in order, I quote, to gain practical skills in the field of architecture in Paris, end of quote. Despite her fa failure in the competition for the National Pavilion, she remained persistent in her efforts to participate at the International Exhibition of Art and Technology at any cost. 
Before I continue in Parisian Odyssey of Magda Jancova, it is necessary to tell you more about her. Magda Jancova was one of the female, ar few female architects who were active in their profession in the interwar Czechoslovakia. She graduated in 1930 with the project of a luxury hotel for international, gu international guests at the riverbank of Vltava, a river running through the city of Prague. The project was published in contemporary architectural press along with graduate project, project of her peers from the Czech Technical University, who were again exclusively, exclusively male. Soon afterwards, she designed and constructed a family home in Prague, where she later lived in. Not only did she design the house, but she supervised the construction on site, as we can see on these photographs. Later on, Jancova worked for Czech architect Vladimir Greger, where she was responsible for the whole office, dealing with clients, organizing work, and supervising constructions. In these terms, Jancova appears to be quite extraordinary, even in comparison with her other Czech, with other Czech women architects who were able to work in their profession at that time. She went directly in competition with the tasks meant for men. Instead of writing in lifestyle magazines or the newspaper supplements uh, intended for women, she published in her, her writings directly in architectural press, aiming at professional audience. She was able to carry out an architectural project from the first ideas to the final execution on site. And also, she was ambitious enough to be willing to become an independent architect with her own office. That was probably also a reason why she left her job in Prague, put all her effort into the competition for a project for the Czechoslovak Pavilion at the Paris Exhibition in 1937, and left for, uh, left for Paris for a fellowship in order to gain experience there. This is a map uh, of the Paris Fair, and the red arrows are pointing at locations where Jan Magda Jancova was trying to get, it, get involved as an architect. Excuse me. Yeah, come back. The first arrow uh, next to the Tour Eiffel uh, shows the location of the Czechoslovak National Pavilion, but it was not the only place where it was possible to participate at the immense scale of the exhibition. The foreign participants would take part in the exhibition within the National Pavilion of their own country or in a group that was approved by the General Committee or as a seller of goods. Jancova remained faithful to her nationality and after her failure in the main competition, she tried to succeed with the project for Czechoslovak Pavilion of Sales. According to her records, it might have been located near, near to Grand Palais where the second arrow points out. See it up there. Uh, the purpose of the pavilion was a sale of national products. She was commissioned to design the pavilion by, by certain engineer Holo, that means pigeon, and even a model of her project was made. However, uh, her design did not come through because of the French concession, and Jancova describes that the reason was a need for a French architect who will be responsible for the construction. In this case, I can only guess, uh, but one of the additional Czechoslovak pavilion at the fair was the industrial pavilion designed by a French architect, André de la Croix, which we can see on this photograph. But I have no further information where it could, whether it could have anything to do with the original task of Jancova. Surprisingly, it was still not enough for Jancova to give up on her, uh, to give up her engage engagement with the exhibition. And in the spring of 1937, she entered the exhibition ground with a private enterprise with her brother. She designed a small commercial stand of 35 square meters with Czech and Slovak products, mainly glass and bijouterie. Because of the fellowship she was receiving from the Czechoslovak government, she had to report to the committee in her home country about the progress of her stay. She reflected on the present structure in following words, I, I, I quote, I endeavored to design a pavilion in the spirit of the Czech countryside with the Slovak decor. 
and it gave me a certain joy not to be limited to a design of a modern cube, end of quote. To show her work to the committee, she made a thorough photo documentation of the small pavilion, following the pattern of the exhibition when making pictures in the daylight, as well as when lit in the electrical lights in the night. The cozy stand with uh, folklore motifs and traditional Czech glass and costume jewelry was located at the Parc d'Attraction à l'Espanade en Valide, as the third arrow indicates. It is the green ground located on the axis between Tom Palais and Palais d'en Valide. In her reports, Jansova described the difficulties she and her brother were facing with the organizers of the exhibition. They could not afford the French workers to construct the pavilion, nor the Czech ones, and Jancova with her brother were building the structure with their own hands. Her role was that of an architect, supervisor, worker, and uh, a decorator. And as she reported to Prague, she was rewarded by a very positive feedback from the visitors of the exhibition. <laughs> Because of the intense work of the, on the site, Jancova left her job at the office of the French architect Stephen de Sauer, where she was working. And later on, she was trying to get into practice at the famous atelier of Le Corbusier in Paris. At the very same time, while Jancova was painting the folklore motifs and little birds on the cozy pavilion, Le Corbusier received a letter from a powerful man and a general director of the state railroads, Raoul Dautry, who was pleading for Jansova in following works. I quote, given her extraordinary taste for modern architecture, Mademoiselle Jansova would be happy to work under your guidance. I know that you have some work now, and I would be pleased if you could entrust her with some work, end of quote. The Czech architect was received to the office of Le Corbusier immediately and she became the only Czech woman architect to enter the famous atelier. Soon afterwards, Jancova published a critique of the winning Czechoslovak pavilion in the Czech architectural press. She claimed the architecture of the pavilion to be an exposed object itself and criticized the discrepancy between the outer appearance of the pavilion and the quality of the exposition inside. It is necessary to mention that Czech glass and cost costume jewelry represented an important part of the official exhibition. As we can see on the photograph, it was a demonstration of national craft and largely exported goods. When we look at the two projects that Magda Jancova created for the World's Fair in 1937, we can hardly find any similarities. And we must ask, how can we understand the contradictory character of the designs? But I suggest to look at them from two perspectives. <coughs> from the individual perspective of the Czech architect, it seems that she understood any kind of participation at the fair as a career opportunity that could help her to become more independent. She tried to get involved in all possible means that the rules of the fair enabled, and finally she succeeded with her own private enterprise, which she represented at the folklore, where she represented the folklore of her own country. And from the perspective of the ideological representation of the Czechoslovak Republic, her choice was not completely out of the frame of the national program. When we compare the interior of the winning national pavilion and the exposition of glass inside, with the display at the commercial stand of Jancova on the pictures on the right, the extreme difference between the two projects almost disappears. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and our last speaker in this panel is uh, Ladislav Jensen who's um, an art historian and uh, architecture historian based at the Technical University of Brno. So um, he's uh, from our home ground, home ground. 
Uh, and uh, his most recent publication uh, in, in a sort of long list uh, of various research projects uh, is a monograph that's attached to uh, a big exhibition on a leading mo modernist uh, architect, uh, Jan Kotiera. And uh, the book and the exhibition were um, done with uh, his colleague, uh, Helena Chapkova. So hello everyone, I would like to uh, thank again to the organizers of this, of this lovely event and it's great to finally uh, meet people in person. Um, so in my contribution, I will focus on the transformation of the presentation of the Czech Slovak state and its successors at the World Fair in New York held in the years 1939 to 1940, which got a general title, The World of Tomorrow. My motivation for this contribution, uh, my motivations for this contribution are two. Since 2016, I have been researching Czech American engineer and architect Jaroslav Josef Polivka, who had worked with Frank Lloyd Wright on eight projects in the last 13 years of his life. In his extensive private archive, which I had the opportunity not only to go through, but also to organize and digitize, there is also documentation of his involvement in the design and organization of the Czech Slovak presentation at this World Fair. My research on JJ Polivka also shows an aspect that I would like to present here today and which in my opinion should become a defining approach for the research of national pavilions. The theory of material agency, mater mater materiality, uh, which I understand um, is uh, the idea that culturally constructed materials represent networks of interest, uh, which want something and promote something in the building culture and exist invisibly apart from the interests of artistic and aesthetic creators and their collectives, as well as for the interests of the individual and corporate clients. I will try to defend why this approach to dominate in the next couple of minutes. It will help me to develop my argument that I can basically follow where Marta Filipova's a very inspiring study paper, uh, which was titled Highly Civilized Yet Very Simple Images of the Czechoslovak State and Nation uh, at Interwar Worlds Fair, published last year in Nationalities Papers. In her conclusion, uh, where she deals with the representation of the Czech Slovak Republic at the World's Fair in New York, Filipova argues, quote, Czechoslovak Minister Hurban, Mayor Lagardia, President of the Fair, Groben Whalen, and Czechoslovak Commissioner, General George Janeček, replaced the organizers of the now disappeared state and continued to administration, sorry, continued the administration of the Czechoslovak display, end quote. An exception among the sup sup superseded organizers, however, is one figure, Jaroslav Josef Polivka, who wasn't just a basically non-participating structural engineer, but a very active organizer, also thanks to his language skills and networks of contacts. Since Jaroslav Polivka did not participate in the competition, we do not have documentation for the preparation of the pavilion from the very beginning in his archive. The first document in his archive is from July 18, 1938. However, the archive of Ladislav Machoň, who also participated in the architectural competition, contains a valuable source of information about the preparations for the pavilion and the materials agency that we are focusing on. The terms of the competition announced by the Minister of Public Works state, quote, let the building be designed so that it can be assembled on site from the finished important, imported parts if possible. The frame is either steel or wooden, but other building materials uh, or their combinations are not excluded. Consideration should also be given to the use of decorative building materials of Czechoslovak origin." End quote. Unlike the pavilion at the World Fair in Paris in 1937, which we saw thanks to Martin Harabova, which was to show mainly Czechoslovak steel and glass, no such emphasis was placed on exhibiting building materials this time. Why? We'll get to that later. However, the lobby of interested parties began immediately after the announcement of the competition. On April 23, 1938, Mahoney received a letter 
from the Czechoslovak Society for the Improvement of Timber Management, quote. If you take part in this competition, please be so kind and take into account in your project the use of wood as the basic construction material, which has recently became, com became commonplace in large civil engineering works and structures again, because we are convinced that, th that when considering the economy of construction, the use of wood will, of course, be practical for you as well, end quote. The letter is signed by the chairman of this company, of this um, organization, uh, an influential architect and professor at the Technical University in Prague with a number of academic positions, Theodor Petschik. However, as the surviving designs show, the architects opted for a steel structure. Only Mahoň probably chose a combination of steel and wood due to his friendship with Petschik. Some literally wanted to repeat the glass steel miracle from Paris from 1937 because they probably thought that glass and steel would be again the dominant raw material that Czechoslovakia will want to show off and ultimately sell on the global market. The winner was the design of Kamil Roškot, who was inspired by his earlier project of the Czechoslovak pavilion at the World's Fair in Chicago in 1933, in terms of construction and general disposition, as Marta Filipová showed in her paper that I cited earlier. However, Roškot also based his project very closely on a detailed construction program uh, and uh, the, an, an ideological layout sketch from the beginning of April 1938 by Jan Sucharda, a ministry official. Jan Sucharda was the author of detailed in instructions that required the Czech-Slovak expo exposition to be stage staged as a theater because the presentation was to be measured to quote, an American audience whose mentality I think Kaiserling described as mentality of a 15 year old girl, end quote. He called on architects and designers to keep, keep in mind, quote, the romantic, romantic and naive, but at the same time to very specific things and concepts oriented American psyche, end quote. The result of these ideas was probably rather bizarre diorama of George Washington being sworn into office. When Griffith Conrad Evans, a professor of mathematics at the University of California at Berkeley, applied for Polivka to be a paid researcher in 1941, he praised him as a, quote, person in charge of the design and construction of the Czech pavilion at the World Fair in New York, end quote. As Polivka archives show, it was not just an attempt to exaggerate his merits, but an image close to reality. On July 18, 1938, Polivka was commissioned by the Witkowice Mining and Metallurgical Company to, quote, mediate communication between Roškot, the architect, and the Witkowice Mining Company, to draw up static calculations and plans, to conduct all inquiries, to order construction raw materials and works, to supervise construction works on site and to arrange all the works in New York City. And multiple trips were planned from the beginning to design the brick and concrete parts according to the steel structure, to keep a construction diary and to hand over the finished building to the Ministry of Public Works." End quote. This considerable, considerable responsibility was entrusted to Polivka, probably due to his contacts at the ministry, his networking among, among architects and artists, because Polivka was a member of the professional art organization Manes, as well as supply companies, especially in the field of glass blocks and glass concrete constructions. According to immigration records, Polivka and his wife arrived to the United States on August 31st, 1938, for the very first time, because the construction of the pavilion was to take place in the fall of that year. The Polivka stayed at the Bedford Hotel on 40th Street in Manhattan. Later, Polivka's son Milos, also a civil engineer, arrived uh, in the fall of 1938 and got a, a short-term job at Columbia University to design bus stations. In December, Polivka wrote to the Legacy Council at the Czechoslovak Embassy in Washington, Karel Břejška, who became the main coordinator of the project at the Czechoslovak Embassy in Washington. Quote, 
I will stay here until the end of January 1939 and leave when construction is in full swing, and we are sure that the construction will be completed on time. So far, we have had various obstacles, partly due to the bad, we we bad weather and partly because we had to remove the large concrete foundations of the old asphalt plant on our construction site, end quote. Karol Břeška became not only a close collaborator, but also a very close friend of Polivka. They were in touch after the war again. Although the New York Czechoslovak consulate, consulate issued Polivka with a cover letter to, to return to, Czechoslo to Europe, to Czechoslovakia, on February 11, 1939, Polivka returned to Czechoslovakia sometime at the turn of April and May 1939. This is evidenced by a family photo album showing a stop on the way from the New York City to Europe to Madeira Islands and the Swiss National Fair in Zurich, which was not opened until May 6 of that year, 1939. At the beginning of May, however, the Ministry of Public Works wanted the pavilion to be approved and on May 10, Witkowice Mining Company sent Polivka to New York again. Polivka received $300 for, from the ministry and left on May 24. Polivka must have been in New York on May 31st when the pavilion was ceremoniously opened together with New York Council Josef Mračna and Ministry's construction engineer Oldřich Šetička. Polivka was selected as the coordinator of the entire project, also mainly because the pavilion was to include structures made of glass glass blocks and glass concrete structures, similar to the dome at the exhibition in Paris. However, their implementation did not take place. Later, in 1944, in the application for American citizenship, Polivka assessed the whole situation as follows, quote, unfortunately, the New York Pavilion was denied the most impressive structural materials, glass and glass concrete, since Hitler, after invading Czechoslovakia in 1939, did not permit shipment of the glass units which had been especially manufactured for the pavilion. Despite strong opposition by Hitler, which handicapped and delayed completion of the Czechoslovak pavilion, in May 1939, the Czechoslovak ambassador in Washington, Colonel Herban, Herban uh, opened the pavilion even though not yet completed due to obstructions resulting from Hitler's invasion to Czechoslovakia, end quote. Thanks to Polivka's archive, these difficulties can be reconstructed. The construction work was entrusted to the New York firm Hegemann Harris Company. The company also built Russian and other pavilions. Russian pavilion was right next to the Czechoslovak pavilion. As evidenced by John C. Hegemann's letter of April 26, 1939 to Polivka. Quote, we have had many troubles on the Russian building in the way of obtaining the marble which was shipped from Russia and, and in fabricating it for use. All the buildings that were entrusted to our care will be done on time, uh, with the possible exception uh, that there, are, there may be uh, some little interior work still to be done in the Russian building, end quote. The strategy how the German occupation administration wanted to prevent the completion and opening of the pavilion of Czechoslovakia after the proclamation of the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia on March 16, 1939, was to cancel the supply and building materials. However, the first part of the steel parts was already shipped from Witkowice Mining and Metallurgical Company in early March and the rest of the steel parts were actually supplied by the American Pennsylvania Steel Company Incorporated. Polivka made sure of that. However, the delivery of glass fittings for the glass concrete structures, which Polivka particularly cared about, and which he arranged with the glass works in Kamenitsky Shenov and the Fishman and Sons glass works, had already been stopped, and these elements were not used in the pavilion at all. Unlike the Paris Pavilion, where the construction structure was the main exhibition item, this did not matter that much. Therefore, Roshkot's design, where the glass concrete structures and the steel construction was to be rather hidden, originally with granite blocks, could have won. 
and the designs showing off the glass steel constructions, such as designs of Bohus by Bohuslav Fuchs, Ladislav Machoň, or, or Josef Karel Žiha, clearly failed. The orientation of the presented export offer was completely different than two years before in Paris. As the presentation in New York, at, sorry, at the presentation in New York, the focus was to present the light industry, jewelry, glass, clothing, and especially shoemaking. As the reports of Czechoslovak export to the United States years prior to the fair show, the export of shoes doubled between 1936 and 1937, as did the export of utility and decorative glass, jewelry, and artificial flowers, which was still a minor item, but it's still not glass, but uh, glass or steel, but uh, still it doubled. Businessmen, prototypes of self-made men who realized their dreams in the environment of Czechoslovakia interwar capitalism, shoemaking magnets from the Batya family had eminent business interests in the United States in 1937 to 1939. They founded new factory towns, for example, in Maryland, and it was certain that it was the United States where they would focus their investments in the, in the coming years. The construction office of the Batya company even submitted, submitted their own design, including detailed proposals for the contents of the Czechoslovak pavilion in New York. Even though it was not selected, it was Batya's corporate vision of Czechoslovakia in the future that became the central motive of the resulting exposition. The adored godlike figure who was at the center of a huge figurative stained glass window was, um, was neither President Masaryk nor any of the national heroes and saints, uh, but a businessman and the founder of the shoe empire, Tomáš Batya. His brother, his brother Jan Antonin's vision of a state for 40 million people prevailed here where the Czech lands represented an advanced cultural and civilized part of the country, Slovakia, a rural and folk destination with unspoiled nature for the tourism of rich Czechs, and Carpathian, Carpathian Ukraine, undesirably, uh, sorry, undesirable, uncivilized and wild territory, which is a source of minerals. This idea was not only the result of Czech domestic colonialist ignorance, but also served the economic interests of the Batya Empire very well. In order to benefit from this idea, it was perfect to connect everything with an efficient transport infrastructure and start making full use of cheap labor in the, in, in the eastern parts of the country and exploit the natural sources from these areas. It was precisely this trend in the privatization of the state representation that made it possible to significantly change the original architectural construction and material intentions of the pavilion. Unlike in Paris, it was not the main exhibit. However, Polivka also benefited from this situation. Although he had known the Batyas since the first half of the 1930s and probably cons consulted the construction of some of their department stores in Czechoslovakia, the successful presentation in New York uh, strengthened their relations and Polivka could work during the summer and part of the fall of 1939 on the development of Batyas production campus in Maryland. As a memento of current Nazi aggression towards Czech lands, Polivka himself mentioned the unfinished pavilion in his opening speech. Quote, the Czechoslovak pavilion, as it appears today on the opening day of May 31st in the war, is the work of untiring efforts of the nation it represents in the world of tomorrow. Admittedly, the structure itself, as well as the scope of exhibits displayed therein, are far from what the Czechoslovak exposition would have been originally, had not the country gone through a terrific ordeal on the turmoil of political and economic pressure." End quote. As it is apparent, the role of the organizer in the design and implementation of the Czech Slovak pavilion at the World Fair in New York in 1939 to 1940 had a major impact on Polivka's life trajectory. He could easily, uh, quite easily immigrate to the United States thanks to the established network of contacts, as well as his sons. As early as December 1938, Polivka urged his other son, Jan, to take advantage of his Swiss citizenship and join the list 
uh, of uh, Swiss applicants waiting for immigrate, to immigrate to the United States. In the meantime, he arranged for his other son, Milos, to work for R. H. Shreve in his architectural firm, Shreve, Lamp and Harmon. Polivka got acquainted with Shreve thanks to the World Fair in Paris in 1937. However, they did not meet there directly. Shreve fell in love with the ceramic statue of a seahorse, which was exhibited at the Czechoslovak Pavilion by the ceramic school in Teplice Shanov, and he made great efforts to obtain it. Sometime later, the school has produced a copy for him. This moving story was published in Tourism, Skiing, Climbing, Water Sports, and Camping magazine, and Polivka contacted him on this basis during his stay in New York. In the fall of 1939, Polivka moved to the West Coast, to San Francisco Bay Area. He probably contacted his longtime friend, Lars Jorgensen, whose company was based in the famous Hobart building in San Francisco. And soon afterwards, Polivka became a member of the University of California in Berkeley on October 20, 1939. His wife did not arrive to the United States until April 1940. However, this also had a consequence for the ongoing Czechoslovak national representation. Thanks to Polivka's move, part of, the, part of the exhibition moved in May 1940 from New York to the World Fair in San Francisco, which took place on the artificial treasure island in the middle of the bay. As we can see, Polivka is a perfect example of personal, personal becoming political and vice versa. In my paper, I have tried to show that even in the case of national exhibition pavilions at modern world fairs, we should not be satisfied only with the idea of a designer's creative gesture, and not only with the study of political ideals and propaganda, the political and social commission that determines their architectural and design form. There is another rather invisible financial interest network behind all this, and that is the lobby of raw materials. I join architectural historians who, such as Sandra Karina Leške, realize that like the built environment and language of architectural elements, building materials can not only carry a meaning, but also want something from their actors. As architectural historian Akos Moravansky teaches us, our interest should not be directed to the analysis of materials using the natural sciences, but on the contrary, we must ask, about the cultural construction of materials and in reverse, their reconstruction of the culture. This aspect easily escapes us when we can no longer visit the vast majority of national pavilions in person due to their ephemerality and realize their material, ma materiality and their material essence. Thank you for your time and for your attention. Well, thanks very much for such a uh, lovely talk. Can I ask you to stay here and invite uh, the other speakers, um, Gaspar and Martina? Uh, yeah, we've got a very decent time for discussion. Um, and so I would like to invite the audiences here and online for uh, to, to ask. Any questions to the speakers? Matthew. Uh, thank you very much for three very interesting papers. Um, I've got questions for Gaspar and for Ladislav. Gaspar, I, I, I was you know, listening with great interest in, in, in Sobel and, and what you were saying. What, what struck me, um, I, I couldn't quite get a sense of what he was really saying about buildings. Europe is part of the European mainstream. Um, and I don't know, it would be interesting to know whether he sort of says that. And, and the reason I ask that is simply because, I mean, you know better than me that at the same time as the Millennium Exhibition, uh, you've got, well, in fact, as part of it, you've got... Um, you know, Lechner's Museum of Applied Arts, which is putting forward a, a very different notion 
of where Hungary belongs, and it's emphasizing its kind of Eastern mythical origins, which seems to be completely at odds with the kind of image of the uh, of the exhibition. So there's a kind of contradiction there, and and I just wondered um, what you know whether that's registered or whether you know how people deal with that, um, or or do they just are they bl blind to it or they just overlook it? You know, I, I don't know what the answer is, obviously. So, so that's a, my question to you. And then the, the question to Ladislav and, and perhaps to Martina as well is that it, it something I often find missing from accounts of world fairs in the 30s is that setting them into the context of the of, of economic policy that was taking place in the 30s, where you had protectionism. You know, after the depression, you had massive tariff, tariff barriers, um, and uh, which often makes me wonder. You know, in a in, in a world in which actually everything is working against international trade, what did the organisers of the fairs actually think they were doing? Um, because I mean, it was only Britain that was promoting free trade, and even that sort of, you know, with the gold standard and all the rest of it, that came into question. So, so. I suppose, in a way, this interest in America, is that because, is that related to American trade policy? Is that why Batya, you know, was interested in America, apart from the fact of it being the land of opportunity, but were there quite concrete economic calculations behind that? I'd be interested to know. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your question. And um, I think it's a, a very important point because, um, Mm, it's part also of the de development of the um, scholarship or discipline of art history uh, in Hungary, uh, how the founding fathers, as uh, Imre Henselmann, defined the, the most important goals or most important um, uh, tendencies to follow. Um, how can we uh, contextualize um, Hungarian art and architecture yeah, in, the, in the European mainstream or as well in the Western mainstream? Um, and it was a um, double position. On the one hand, um, from the beginning, it was quite clearly said that um, this Hungarian art and architecture is on the periphery, um, as also um, Imre Henselman, um, uh, contemporary to the, the dimensioned Eitelberger, for example, uh, stressed that it's, um, it, it was a kind of a peripheral position, um, the position of the medieval art and architecture um, within the European mainstream or the European uh, artistic context or ar artistic connections. On the other hand, uh, they were stressing this, uh, this connection with the Western art, with the West Western tendencies. And uh, what you mentioned is um, it's very hard to uh, detect, um, so to say, what was um, what appeared in the public eye because uh, what we know, so press reactions and, and, uh, and accounts on the, on the exhibitions were mostly um, also directed by political um, agents or somehow, um, so they were, weren't unbiased, ambi uh, I would say. Uh, so it's hard to uh, answer your question, but um, what we can clearly see that there was a, um, um, uh, so to say, schizophrenic character, uh, as many scholars um, calls it, of this whole um, historical framing of the exhibition. On the one hand, it was about the um, Hungarian occupation of the later um, uh, territory, might be Hungarian tribes, uh, of the later Hungarian kingdom, which um, evokes, yes, this kind of um, Eastern origin, uh, the, the, the devotion of the um, Eastern values of, um, of, of horse riding um, and so on. And on the other hand, there was this kind of um, um, problem of integration in the Christian uh, Europe. And this kind of dichotomy was uh, present also in the Catholic of Sobor. And I would say also um, in every part related to Hungarian culture or history of the National, uh, National Millennial Exhibition. And, and it, 
it's um, just a very clear sign how fragmented this whole ideological framework was, and how and and we, we if, if we take a closer look at this these very parts of the this kind of ideology, which seems to be uh, at the first look uh, co coherent and consistent, uh, then we see how fragmented it was, and how uh, these um, so, so, so to say concurring on or. Um, 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 tendencies and, and narratives were um, uh, coexisting in this in this whole um, ideological framework. Thank you. Well, um, I've never discovered, and I try to discover some economical aspects that you were you were asking me about. Uh, if there actually was some economical impact of the, uh, or if there were any any uh, any memorandums or any treaties signed uh, with a direct uh, following to to the uh, to the world fairs, and I've never found any. Uh, so I think that they only try to reflect. Um, the export and also it shows, and I tried to show it in the presentation, that uh, this very problematic interference between the uh, private Batya company and the Czechoslovak state and the representation at the World Fair and actually presenting the ideals, ideals of the Batya corporate uh, as, uh, as a national ideals of how the future is going to look like um, was uh, something that became inherent part of the uh, of the Czechoslovak ideology and propaganda at the World Fairs, especially uh, in in New York, and I guess that the success of the Batya Company in in the global measure in South Amer South America and uh, all 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 across Europe um, was something that the Czechoslovak state was uh, sort of looking up to as something that could lead the export numbers from the depression to to. To the black numbers, uh, so that was the that was the aspect, and also um, I don't really think that the uh, that the ministry's officials did did really know, as you were asking, what they're doing <laughs> because because of so many contradictions, and they were trying to put so many things and so many layers in the presentation. And of course, there were interests of the of the architects and designers and the. And the structures and the supplying companies and uh, the cultural scene or the cultural elites that it every time uh, there was some main theme in new york world fair it was the everyday life of a uh, czechoslovak um, czechoslovak um, people but it was just too much yeah but these economical aspects that that's all i found I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, the reason I asked that is just simply because, uh, in fact, when, when before we moved to Brno, when we were in Birmingham, we had a colleague who, who was doing a lot of very detailed economic historical research on the wood industry in Lithuania between the wars, which I personally, I really struggled to find it very exciting, but there we are. <laughs> but, it, but it was important work because he was talking about after 1918, all these barriers were raised against the export and import of raw materials and it seems to me that it it must be possible to look at documents in the ministry of trade to find out what was the policy you know um and look at the diplomatic protocols which i know that you know research on um exhibitions probably has tended to not do that because it opens up a really huge world but probably it's necessary to really get a sense of, you know, if these were supposed to promote trade and yet you have an environment that's trying to reduce trade, as trying to limit international trade, that, that surely needs to be investigated in some way. But, you know, there, but it must be possible. There must be economic historians who could probably just tell you that information, maybe. But I've said enough already. But thank you anyway for your answers. 
So, so very, very briefly, uh, yes, I went through a lot of, there, there is actually a lot of economic historical research done on the Batya com corporate and Batya company, so that's why I was also focusing on that, and uh, that information was quite access is quite accessible. Um, but I think that the, what you're saying might, is, is true because uh, it wasn't really export, they were actually manufacturing the shoes in the countries elsewhere where they were selling them, so that was, I guess, the, the, the new model that they came up with, that it, it is okay for the new limits and the barriers that, that were risen in the 1930s, uh, sort of uh, founding the global market as we know it nowadays, and, um, and also the, the, the success story of a Czech uh, businessman, self-made man, all, all, that, all that kind of crap. So, uh, so uh, and of course, there was an idea that if they sell shoes that they manufacture in South America, North America, now elsewhere, Australia, that it would benefit Czechoslovakia and it would benefit the, the Batya corporate um, in, um, in, in Czechoslovak country. Yeah. Um, hello. This is for you, Martina. Thanks for your presentation. I found the, the story of Magda Jansova quite inspirational, especially her resilience in continuing to, to want to participate um, and working individually as well. And it's interesting that she had to move from the modernist box to the, the um, more craft vernacular to enable her to do that and to actually build with, with her own hands um, and not rely on a team and, and lots of resources. And I was wondering in her career um, in later years, whether this tension between uh, the kind of modern and the traditional and the do-it-yourself versus the uh, more capital intensive, labor intensive, whether that played out in any way. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. I'm afraid I will disappoint you because um, uh, there is a big silence actually after 1937 uh, because I, it was not the subject of my presentation, but she entered uh, the office of Le Corbusier, but she did not remain there very, for very, very long. And uh, afterwards, there is no trace of her. So uh, she, she, she lived, but she was not active as an architect. She she was painting some sort of stuff, but I haven't seen her pieces. And um, in my opinion, I think that this huge uh, outburst of energy she was she gave she gave out in Paris and the years before exhausted her that much that she was not capable to continue. Can I? Okay, thank you. Can I just remind uh, audiences online uh, that they can also ask questions, but please let us know by raising your hand. We don't really have time to read uh, the chat. And uh, in the meantime, I'll ask a follow-up question for Martina. I found it really interesting how you kind of uh, emphasize that uh, with the, the project she submitted for the 37 pavilion, uh, she was the sole architect against uh, these groups of men, architects. And um, so I wonder if was there some particular reason she wanted to just wor work on her own? Uh, did she think that she can kind of penetrate the world um, of male architects? And also I, I did look at her designs for, for the pavilion and, uh, and they're not brilliant uh, as, as uh, um, sort of pavilion architecture because they don't consider all sorts of things that um, um, yeah the architects uh, submitting were asked for like the flow of people she, she doesn't really think about that very well um, in terms of how she arranges the staircases very sort of narrow uh, stairs and so on so I just wonder if there were some kind of reasons why she didn't want to cooperate with a bigger team I have no evidence, but uh, because she was active many years before, uh, she was employed in another office, she was working for, for other people, and I think it was a try how to do something uh, on her own, and maybe she just a bit exaggerated it, but she tried. We have a question from Australia, from Noel White. Um, hi, Mart Martina. 
I was fascinated by Magda's pop-up store in Paris. <laughs> Uh, did uh, she carry this relationship between interiors and exteriors through into her architectural practice or painting practice? Uh, um, given your response, yeah, so interior and exterior. It's a little bit related to what I answered, mm -hmm. that there is so little uh, constructed works concerning her design and her uh, construction that I can't really uh, uh, elaborate it more, but I, I am sorry. I, I wish it could be different. And but I, I guess this is quite important for all of us also to recognize that uh, the evidence basically we don't have in, in, in so many cases. Um, um, and yeah. as I understood it, it's just that she, what she realized, it was something from the inside of the pavilion because there was a huge disharmony between the presentation with the modern style in architecture and then the necessary traditional culture that was meant to be presented inside. So she tried the official way and then she just picked something very natural. And I don't think there is a huge, like in the, in the means of representation of her nationality and of her state, it's sort of compatible of what was necessary to say. So, any more questions here, Sam? Not, not to feel like I'm piling on, Martina. I have another question. And that concerns the materials in the pavilion. You had stated that they were for sale. And I'm wondering how that was financed and if the company whose materials in the pavilion were for sale was different from the company in the Czech pavilion itself, where I understand the materials were not for sale. And also just to bring Marta into this, for the Czech pavilion in Chicago, did they also import the food for the restaurant since foodstuffs in Czechoslovakia are rather different than American foodstuffs? It's a really good point because it was uh, in the descriptions of the small commercial stand, it was only bijouterie. But when you read the photographs more carefully, I, there was not space to go more into details. There is a ham sidle. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a food. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ham. And, and uh, so it is possible there were some other goods offered and it was surrounded with other stands of other nationalities. It was next to a stand of, uh, of Palestinian jewelry or, uh, so, or something like that. So th they were definitely offering several kinds of national goods. And as far as I can guess, uh, it was an enterprise of Magda Jancova's brother who got involved as a businessman in this matter. So he was probably the tradesman, the one who was searching for, for, the, for the things to, to be sold there. And yeah, and as regards the uh, yeah, supplies for the restaurant, um, yeah, it, it is a very interesting question because for instance, in Paris in 37, um, all, all the restaurants usually were uh, run by Pilsner uh, mm -hmm. And um, so in France, they had their own branch. So the, the beer they sold there, they made on the, um, in France, uh, obviously um, with the kind of recipes uh, from uh, Czechoslovakia. But in, uh, in the States, uh, and especially it was, it was a big thing uh, for the 39 um, pavilion uh, when Czechoslovakia disappeared. There, was, uh, there were articles saying, well, at least we, we managed to ship the beer all over to the states so that that was shipped uh, from from Czechoslovakia as as uh, as well as so many other uh, yeah foodstuffs like Prague ham and uh, so this this would be delivered uh, yeah actually so so they sell send the first shipment of the beer to the New York pavilion. We all know yeah. about all the food. Uh, <laughs> so they sell, sent the first shipment of the beer um, right uh, after the uh, the uh, protectorate of Bohemia and uh, Moravia uh, happened. And then, because they were or they were already uh, networks of restaurants in the United States states that were selling the Pilsner beer, then they started to buy the supplies of other restaurants that already was in the United States. 
Just a note on the margins of uh, the previous question of Matthew Rampling concerning the price of materials, uh, because I really, uh, Magda and so I reflected in her notes, the absurd price of everything what is necessary to build on the exhibition grounds. And it was the first thing she criticized was the price of the construction of the official pavilion. And in this context, in the, in the air, with the approaching war, with the really mass massive economical crisis, this, this is sort of a denial, the whole fair of the, of the situation, of the world situation. It's, it's like a swan song before just let's enjoy let's deny it before the problem comes so uh, yeah just just a note also the organization changed between the in case of czechoslovak pavilion between the uh, Paris World Fair and the New York World Fair because it was organized, the Paris one was organized directly by the ministry, uh, but the New York World, New York Pavilion was actually still organized by, by the ministry, but the ministry only sent a huge amount of money, I think it was something about 8 million of Czech crowns to the Witkowice mining and uh, metallurgical company and the uh, company was actually uh, supplying the work to work to the architects, the engineers, the other suppliers and and so on so that was kind of interesting shift of the organization uh of of the pavilion and the founding Julia? and i guess this will be the last question if thank that's you okay. um i didn't want to ask because it's another question for martina so i don't want to overwhelm you well um but um in terms of Jansuba as a woman architect i was wondering uh, what her reputation generally was because she obviously had a very short career if she only graduated in 1930 and then finished in 1937 um, but I wonder so for her entry to the competition uh, and for her reputation as an architect did it matter at all that she was a woman I mean how was that reflected on or, or was it not what was the reception uh, I have no idea I just noticed that she was she was on her own all the time but how it happened she was from a quite influential family she was her her father was a director of a gymnasium in davidsa i don't know if it's a big such a big deal to to penetrate certain circles and um, i i haven't found any note commenting on her being woman or uh, no no it's just i made that point because it was so obvious in the context of other production and writings and so on thank you okay so thank you all very much uh, all the speakers and